Good evening. It's our pleasure to welcome all of you here in the Otto Braun Saal of the Staatsbibliothek to the fourth of our annual Walter Benjamin Lectures. Actually, we are overwhelmed that you all are here and we are very happy uh, to share those evenings with you. My name is Rahel Jägi. I'm together with Robin Zelikates, who is standing next to me, the director of the Center for Social Critique, the institution organizing these lectures. We are very moved and honored by your presence here in the premises of the Staatsbibliothek tonight. And actually, I'm especially happy to be here in the Staatsbibliothek since this is probably one of uh, my favorite places in the world. I mean, I'm working here all the time. So this building we are in represents the architectural utopias of learning and participation of the German post-war era, but needs restorations in the years to come. And so it seems to be a fitting location for the lectures on social transformation that we are about to hear. Yes, a very warm welcome uh, from my side as well. It's really fantastic to see uh, so many of you here gathering to listen and to discuss um, the lectures uh, that Sally Hessinger will give on the possibilities of social transformation, just as um, in the case of this very building, which Rahel just mentioned, Sally Hessinger will actually show in her lectures that we need to understand both the persistence of social and material structures, but also their fragility and their dependence on continued preservation and care in order to identify the starting points for actual transformation processes. So by their very name, the Walter Benjamin Lectures convey a connection to the tradition of critical theory. That link has been important to us and remains so. Critical theory has been a demanding endeavor right from the outset. It seeks to reconstruct reason in history and analyzes how social structures, in particular how capitalism, distorts this reason. We understand critical theory not merely as an academic project, but rather as an analytic and emancipatory approach to come to terms with the multiple crises of today. That is the reason why, to us, the Walter Benjamin Lectures are not and should not be confined to a particular critical method or tradition. As critical theorists did early on, we believe that multiple approaches, multiple crit critical theories can help us to understand how the current social order turns promises of progress into nightmares and progress itself into catas catastrophes. That things go on, just go on, is the catastrophe, as Walter Benjamin famously said. So in order not to just go on like this, we need ideas of how to turn this crisis into a conflict and how to identify alternative tra trajectories for emancipatory social change. And it's precisely for this reason that critical theory in our understanding is linked to social struggles and to agents of social progress, to their motivations, to the knowledge they produce, to their transformative potential, but also to their troubles and the challenges they face. Critical theory cannot be an activity of pure reflection. It has to be partisan in ongoing social conflicts, meaning that its task is first and foremost to analyze such conflicts within the existing social structure and to provide a thorough understanding of their causes and trajectories. Therefore, we are both very happy and very grateful to be able to welcome this year's Walter Benjamin Chair, Sally Hesslinger. Um, <laughs> Um, Sally, whose uh, work is uh, widely influential, of course, and ex exemplifies to our mind this very synthesis of social and political engagement with analytic rigor that critical theory aspires to. Sally Hesslinger is the Ford Professor of Philosophy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the famous MIT in Cambridge, where she also teaches in the Women's and Gender Studies program. Her engagement with critical theory might come as a bit of a surprise, maybe, if you only look at her philosophical training in analytic philosophy and the topics she was especially interested in during the first years of her academic career. But Sally has always been a philosopher and an activist. 
Her long-standing engagement in feminist and anti-racist struggles increasingly brought her to focus on processes of social transformation and the obstacles that they face in her philosophical work and luckily for us, also in conversation with us. Sally's contributions to the theory of ideology are today as indispensable as is her work on practices and social structures and on gender and race as social categories. Her activism has shaped her philosophical work in many ways. Most importantly, Sally thinks about relatively abstract social structures as well as relatively abstract concepts from the perspective of concrete examples and challenges. And she likes to share the stories these examples are part of with her audience, which brings the complex social theory she has been developing very much alive. As she told us in a conversation, her activist friends sometimes make fun of her because she always wanted to dig deeper, to know more about what causes certain situations and what determines the chances for successful action, maybe even to set up a reading group as the first step. <laughs> but we think it's precisely this synthesis between engagement and critical analysis that um, exemplifies this idea of critical theory that the early Marx formulated in his famous uh, sentence that critical theory is the attempt at self-clarification of the struggles and wishes of the age. So talking about the struggles of the age and about our times, we think that the times couldn't be more urgent for a renewal of a social theory that aims at radical transformation. For some years now, we, we see an escalation of multiple crises that tie in into each other. A decade ago, the sense of crisis might have been less acute, even if people have, might have thought that things went in the wrong direction, socially, politically, ecologically. The dominant feeling was that the current social order, that capitalism will last, if not forever, at least for the foreseeable future. Today, this feeling melts into air. The sense of urgency ignites activism. But talking about Germany and the recent tendencies that worry us, this activism is actually met with a social backlash and a wave of intensified repression by the state. Federal prosecutors and specialized police forces launch criminalizing investigations, declare protest groups to be criminal associations, confiscate money and IT infrastructure, and try to subvert solidarity among activists and within civil society as has happened to the last generation. Judges issue harsh sentences against militant anti-fascist activists, claiming to defend a rule of law that has been virtually inexistent for more than three decades now for many victims of racism and Nazi violence. Against this background, it seems both necessary and very welcome again to demonstrate the importance of radical contestation and activism from a theoretical perspective. And it is precisely this what Sally will do in her three lectures. Activisms and social movements, she will argue, are our best chance to transform our societies for the better in situations that are prone to change for the worse. Tonight, in her first lecture, who is in charge here, she will disentangle the complexity of social structures that seem to be immune to political intervention. Tomorrow, she will tackle the question, what can we do, head on. And in the final lecture on Friday night, under the title, Who Cares, she will develop an exemplary theory of social transformation. Before we start, just a few uh, technical remarks. Um, Sally is going to speak for roughly one hour. Uh, we will have time for a Q&A after her lectures. Um, there are two mics available, uh, one on the left side and one on the right side uh, of the auditorium and we'd like to invite you all to queue up after the lecture behind those mics if you would like to ask um, a question and please already know I want to say focus on the questions and not on commentaries um, <laughs> and please uh, also switch off your mobile phones if you haven't done so already we are recording the lectures the camera is right there in the back uh, but only the stage is visible so even if you ask a question you won't be visible on the recording as the, the audio will be hearable, the question will be hearable, that's necessary for the Q&A to make sense to those who will watch it online afterwards, but you will not be um, recorded. Okay, so finally, thanks to everyone who has made this possible. Thanks first and foremost to the fantastic team of the Center for Social Critique 
and to the New Institute Foundation, who generously enables and supports our work at the Center since 2018. Thank you also to our host this year, the Staatsbibliothek, and in particular to Udo Back. And last but not least, we thank Surkamp Verlag, which is our partner for the publication of the Benjamin Lectures, and our new media partners, Philosoph Philosophie Magazine and Agora 42, whose stalls are right in front of the entrance to this hall. So once again, we couldn't be more excited to welcome our dear friend and esteemed colleague, Sally Hesslinger. We are so happy and honored that you have accepted our invitation for this series of lectures. Now it's the floor is open. Here you go. Wow, that's kind of incredible. Um, I'm, I'm deeply humble and honored and joyous to be here. It's, a, it's such a wonderful opportunity. The time I've been able to spend even in the last month has really enriched my thinking about so many things. And I can't believe you're all here. You know, I, here I am, an analytic met metaphysician who, you know, was an activist for a while. And here I am on this stage. It kind of blows my mind. And it wouldn't really have happened had it not been for Robin and Rahel, who have transformed me into a critical theorist, right? You know, oh my gosh, anything is possible, I guess. <laughs> so here I am. Uh, and I'm humble because also the topic is so very difficult and I don't have all the answers. Uh, I'm going to give you the best I've got, but I know you all have even more, and so maybe we can work on this together. I, I certainly hope so. Um, I thank you all for listening to me speak in English because I don't speak German. Um, I recently read a joke that said there's been this new result about the average number of languages Americans speak. Um, it's dropped to 0.7. So, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, one, I'm not quite that bad, but, you know, it's pretty hard. Um, so I'm going to be speaking in part uh, from an... American context, not in part, I mean mostly from an American context because that's where I work and do my activism, but um, I hope that it's going to be relevant to a broader range of, of contexts and situations. Um, and there are going to be some things I say in this lecture that I won't fully defend, but I got three lectures, oh my gosh. Okay, so let's see if this is going to work. Here is the outline. I'm going to start with an introduction and overview. And I know some of you will find some of this really, duh, hello. I mean, we're actually German-speaking philosophers and friends, and we know all that. But anyway, in case you don't, I'll say a little bit. Um, we're then going to talk about dual and triple systems theory, uh, then more generally about systems and structures. Then I'll talk about systems dynamics and cultural logics, and do a bit of conclusion and a preview for next time. Okay, so introduction and overview. And I'll start with a bit of reading because it calms me down. And then as you'll see, I won't be standing here for long. I'll be running around the stage. Okay, so the climate is a complex dynamic system. The system allows for considerable variability across years the weather, um, but it was relatively stable for some time, meaning that the average weather over centuries main, remained within an expected range. This in itself is absolutely remarkable, given that climate is influenced by so many factors, including the water cycle, the carbon cycle, shifting conditions on the core of the earth. Did you know there's a rock cycle? I didn't know that. Biochemical cycles and, of course, human activity. This stability occurs because there are feedback loops between the cycles at different levels that adjust for variation. Now, complex systems don't need to be as complicated or as big as the climate. Something as simple as body temperature involves a looping interaction between systems. 
the nervous system, the circulatory system, et cetera, because after all, your blood vessels change, you know, when they get bigger and smaller, depending on how cold or hot you are, sweating, the limbic system, you know, that helps. And um, that keeps our body temperatures mostly within a particular range. That's a complex dynamic system with a looping effect, right? So we're, you don't have to go to the climate to get that. Now, as we all know, the climate is changing more dramatically and variation is no longer within the normal range. I raise the fact that climate is a complex dynamic system, not because today's lectures are going to be about climate change. I'm not a climate scientist, even though I come from MIT but because we've become familiar with the idea that climate is not like a car engine that is easily decomposable into mechanically related parts. That there are risks of it reaching a tipping point where changes may rapidly cascade. However, another lesson we learn from discussions of climate change is that although humans are not in charge, we can make a difference. So this is like, who's in charge here? You know? The climate, there's nobody in charge, but we can make a difference. That's the lesson. Particular individuals around the climate, but also around other kinds of looping structures, can have a significant influence. And we must engage in collective action to change our relationship to and exploitation of the environment and the societies and peoples in it. My goal in these lectures is to urge you to think of society using a model of the complex dynamic system. I'm not going to argue that human civilization or democracy is on some sort of tipping point and we're all about to die, even though sometimes it seems that way. So to that extent, bringing up climate change may be misleading. But if we begin to see society as a kind of complex dynamic system, then I hope we can better understand its stability, its variation, and its potential for transformative change. So societies, have a variety of interacting systems as well. The economy, the political system, religion, and other cultural formations, and material subsystems like transportation systems, healthcare systems, carceral systems. And a fundamental assumption of social theory is that social formations are at least partly composed of individuals. And individual agency is important to explaining how they work. This gives us the macro level, the system, and the micro level, the individual. But I maintain that there is a meso level that is not always aptly recognized, um, which is the level of social practices. Social practices are a site where culture is enacted by individuals in response to material conditions and the relationships, and there are the rela where relationships and networks are formed. So broadly speaking, there are three sets of questions that arise in the project of social theory. One sort of questions is ontological. How do social formations develop, change, expand, disappear, etc.? And I've already gestured at my ontology. Societies are complex systems composed of networks of social relations established in practices. And I'm gonna talk a lot about that so I know it sounds just like words at the moment, but just you wait. Um, that gives us, okay, uh, I've gestured at that. Another set is normative. How do we form societies? Um, what are good or rational ways to do it? And the third set is critical. Why are current societies irrational, oppressive, and unjust? Why is it so hard to break the patterns of oppression and injustice? And how might we have transformative social change? Now, in my work, I'm mostly concerned about the third critical set of questions. However, to answer them, I think we also need to consider the first two sets. So, um, <laughs> a better understanding of social ontology, I think, how social formations emerge and become stable, and how to locate the leverage points for change can inform both our critique and our activism. But I'm going to today take up questions mainly that are ontological, and I will turn in the next two lectures to talk a bit more about the more normative and critical considerations. Um, and especially what we can do, given that so much of it depends on us collectively. Okay, so I told you, here we are. We're gonna talk about social reproduction. Now, this is gonna be really obvious to most of you, but I give this to my students because, you know, they don't all know everything. So, there's exploitation, there's Marx, there's the resources and means of production, trees, factories. 
there's labor, a human laborer, and that produces a commodity. We know that, right? The commodity is sold for $3 signs. $1 sign goes to pay for the resources and means of production, and my students always say, yeah, and R&D, right, because they're going to be the people who are doing research and development. And I go, yeah, okay, okay. That pays for all that. Then there's another dollar sign goes to labor, and whoa, there's surplus value that goes to the capitalist, right? We all know this, right? But who produced the laborer, right? That's the question of social reproduction, and that's what socialist feminists have been worried about for a very long time. That this model completely ignores women's labor in the home, in the domestic sphere, and the ways in which the laborer is produced and maintained. Okay, this is the issue of social reproduction. So social systems not only manage sexual reproduction, because to have a baby, you know, some kind of egg and sperm have to get together, but also the broad range of social and cultural work required for humans to become part of society. This is also done as, un this is done as unwaged work in the family. Also, historically, it was unwaged work done by slaves. And it's wage service work and education, and we know it's usually assigned to women. Yeah, I allow. There are some good men out there, right? They, they do a little bit of the work. But if you look globally, who's doing this work of social reproduction? It's women. The work of social reproduction includes, this is from Evelyn Nakano Glenn, who's done wonderful work on, uh, on you know, the force to work, forced to do care. Um, the array of activities and relationships involved in maintaining people both on a daily basis and intergenerationally, such as purchasing household goods, preparing and serving food, laundering and repairing clothing, maintaining furnishes and appliances, socializing children, that takes a lot of work and for many, many years. Uh, providing care and emotional support for adults and maintaining kin and community ties. This is mostly unwaged, though increasingly it has been commodified and has, been, has become wage labor. But even when it's waged, it's mostly done by women. Social reproduction theory considers how these different processes interact to result in persistent forms of injustice. That is part of where Glenn is talking about how this labor is divided very differently to base, based on race and class, etc. Okay, so dual and triple systems theory thinks that we have capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy, and they are the ones that are interacting and doing sort of dividing the labor of social reproduction. So dual theory offers one account of it, and Chintia Aruza says it, puts it this way, we can put the original version of this multi-systems thesis in the following terms, gender and sexual relations constitute an autonomous system which combines with capitalism and reshapes class relations, while also being at the same time modified by capitalism in a process of reciprocal interaction. The most up-to-date version of this theory includes racial relations, also considered as a system of autonomous social relations interconnected with gender and class relations. So you might already be going, whoa, how is it autonomous, but also reciprocal interaction? Whoa, that's a little weird. Okay, we're going to talk about that because it's not really autonomous. Just, just that's a little for, you know, a little anticipation of what's to come. So I'm going to focus on the dual systems model than the tr rather than the triple systems model, though it will come up again um, because it's simpler to deal with two systems at a time. And I'm also not going to focus on what's essential to each. So what is essential to capitalism? What's essential to patriarchy, etc.? Because after all, patriarchy predated capitalism, as we know. Um, and how race relates to capitalism is a complicated question that I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A. But I'm going to talk about how these are intertwined in our current social formation. So here's the plan. I favor a single complex system approach to our historically specific social formation, but I agree that there's something important about identifying reproductive and caregiving subsystems and their role in producing race, gender, class, and their intersections. Oh, I forgot to mention, Christian, yes. If anybody is having trouble reading the slides in the back or because you have um, a vision impairment, please raise your hand and Christian will bring you a copy of the slides. I see one in the back, I see some over here. Thank you, okay, great. 
Yes, I forgot. We had those made for that reason, and then I spaced it out. Too excited. OK. Um, I'll argue that the relevant subsystems are not patriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism. Instead, the subsystems are the material systems of healthcare, education, transportation, and the like. And the material subsystems produce social subjects who are finely differentiated, though it's possible to trace patterns of gendering, racialization, and class status. The subsystems and the system as a whole are patriarchal, white supremacists are capitalists insofar as the dynamics of the system produce and reinforce gender, race, and class. And I'm going to say more about systems theory. I'm going to say more about what the dynamics are and why the dynamics matter. But first, I'm going to go over some multi-systems theory. And then at the very end, I'll say more where we're going. Did that help everybody? Do you have now? Anybody else desperately need more? I think we may be out, but I will see what can be done, OK? All right, so dual and triple systems theory. Classic dual systems theory. This is the classic version. Patriarchy is a trans-historical system that takes different forms in different times and cultures for managing sex reproduction, child care, and other forms of domestic labor in ways that produce usually binary subjects, like binary gendered subjects, men and women, girls and boys. In the current social context, it intersects with the capitalist economic system that manages wage, labor, and production. So here's this idea that there's different systems and they interact to, you know, create that laborer that we talked about. So assuming a nuclear family with a caregiver breadwinner family structure, that is plausibly the result of kind of industrialization, you know, back in the day when agriculture was sort of the norm for how people supported themselves, it was not so much the breadwinner caregiver, the women still did the, the social reproduction. Anyway, Patriarchy establishes norms for binary gender that socialize girls to act in and identify with the sphere of the domestic and the home, and boys to act and identify with the public and the work world. So they, the, the process of social reproduction is different from, but feeds into the economic sphere of capitalism. Okay, this is Iris Young, Iris Marion Young, a uh, brilliant social theorist. And she has, back in the day, this was in 1980, she presented her main criticisms of the dual systems model. And she said that taking patriarchy to be a trans-historical system that is instantiated across contexts is inadequate because treating differences in the specific characteristics of sex oppression as merely expressions of one and the same universal system of male dom domination trivializes the depth and complexity of women's oppression. And if we look closely at how the model works, patriarchy's function is to sustain the economic structure, and this doesn't make it a separate system in the relevant sense. So it's not genuinely autonomous. The whole idea of dual systems theory is that patriarchy is there just to, to gender the subjects so that then they can play their role in, in the economy. Okay. So this is a, a, a way of elaborating the first point about depth and complexity. So here's capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy, and there are the subjects, and white supremacy produces white ones and black ones, right? They, it creates race. We recognize differences that are really very superficial, right? But it, it constitutes us, it creates us as social subjects, as black or white or, or Hispanic or Asian or Native American or whatever. Okay, and then it genders us. Patriarchy comes along and genders us. And there we are, now we have, uh, we're either men or women, boys or girls. That's the result of patriarchy. And then capitalism makes one of us go home and the other one go to work, right? Now this is silly. But in a way, this is what the dual systems model or triple systems model is saying. You've got these different systems that do these different things, and one of them is creating the, the work world, and one of them is creating gender, and the other is creating, creating race. But this layer cake, this is a layer cake model, 
has been long criticized by black feminists and others who are concerned with intersectionality, saying that intersectionality is not best understood as an interaction between capitalism and patriarchy and white supremacy that are acting independently or autonomously. There's a different model for how to think about intersectionality. So the integrated interpolation, I think, is something like this. There's a healthcare system, and the healthcare system produces people who are gendered and raced and classed based on whether they've got white coats or not white coats. Well, <laughs> I'm just kidding, you know, really, it's not about that. But anyway, but so you see there's a way in which the system, one system, is producing all of these differences in these different ways. And so we need to think about, whoa, how is it doing that? How is a healthcare system gendering? How is it, how is it racializing? And how is it differentiating people by class? Okay, so patriarchy, so this is, the next point, and I'm gonna elaborate this a bit more, but that last point a bit more, but this is the point about how patriarchy would not really be autonomous if the dual systems model is right. So it supposedly reproduces the worker um, and the support system the worker relies upon, but the economic conditions structure the positions they must occupy. So this is, again, going to show, well, patriarchy ends up kind of as, you know, a, a, an accessory, so to speak, to capitalism. So in the breadwinner, breadwinner caregiver example, the economic conditions divide society into the spheres of work and home. Nancy Fraser talked about that last time. That's one of the things that, that capitalism does is divide um, different spheres of labor. And patriarchy interpolates social subjects who occupy the different spheres. So that's the work of, of capitalism. Capitalism is the black and blue one. And then what happens is patriarchy supplies what capitalism needs. But as Young argues, the dual systems model gives no material weight to the system of patriarchy, which it defines in its basic structure as independent of the mode in relations of production the social relations that proceed from them and the process of historical change. So on the dual systems model, the ch historical change and the way in which we're divided economically is done by capitalism and patriarchy is just the handmaiden, so to speak, of capitalism to say, okay, we'll produce what you need. We'll produce girls and boys, men and women to play their appropriate roles in the system. So it ends, um, by ceding to the traditional theory of production relations, the primary role in giving account of women's concrete, concrete situation. So Young is concerned that this doesn't really take into account the depth and the, the autonomy of uh, women's oppression. Okay, so Nancy Fraser, friend of ours. Um, Nancy also thinks that there's a contemporary uh, in the contemporary context, it's just a single system. So she and I agree on that, but there are ways in which we disagree, and I'm gonna be elaborating that. So she says, a capitalism should include the entire historically elaborated social totality, the whole instit institutionalized societal order, in which social reproduction is a necessary but a hidden part. So she says, no, they're not autonomous systems. And in fact, this is in a way what Young was arguing, that they're not autonomous systems. It's not really a dual systems theory. It's a single system theory, and we need to have a better understanding of how the system works. But Nancy thinks that that single system is the system of capitalism. So, um, she says, this is a quote from her, structurally the division between social reproduction and commodity production is central to capitalism. Indeed, it is an artifact of it. This is my uh, highlight. Historically, the split between productive wage work and unwage reproductive labor has underpinned modern capitalist forms of women's subordination. Reproductive labor is split off, relegated to a separate private domestic sphere where societal importance is obscured. Okay, so this is exactly what Jung was worried about. She was saying, oh my gosh, if capitalism is the motor of history, if capitalism is really how, how you know, our divisions of labor are formed, then patriarchy again is just a handmaiden to capitalism. Okay, so here are my main claims and then I'll try and make them plausible in way how we go forward. 
So I'm a single systems theorist. However, I agree with Young that contrary to Fraser, we should not prioritize capitalism in giving an account of our current social formation. And I'm going to sketch a view of social systems that have the following features. Whoops. As I've already described, the social formation within which we emerge as social agents combines dynamics of race, gender, and class, and this helps to capture intersectionality. Gender and race are patterns across more specific social positions. So you saw how the healthcare system produces those people, and that produces patterns in those people, but it's not producing gender as such and race as such. Come on, oh, yeah, okay, so, sorry, this isn't really that, that legible, but, oh, so here are these different systems, economics, law, science, art, education, mass media, religion, and politics, and these are the systems in society, according to one picture in a recent sociology textbook. And so what I'm suggesting is that, yeah, they get gendered in various ways. The purple is kind of like, you know, it's a bit of both, and the blue is, of course, predominantly masculinized, and the pink, and which one is missing? Okay. Okay, mass media, religion, politics, economics, science, art, education, and what's missing in this picture? Social reproduction, exactly, the household, right? Sociologists, oh my God, oh no, sorry. They can't even get, you know, really, really? You know, this has only been like 50 years we've been talking about this, okay. So the relevant subsystems of the social formation are material, education systems, food systems, transportation, etc. Rather than facing the challenge of addressing the abstract totality of capitalism or white supremacy as such, the targets of social movements should be those concrete material systems. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today, but also in the next two lectures. Okay. Uh, as I will elaborate, the subsystems are concretely material, but they also depend on culture. The looping interaction between the material conditions and what I call the cultural techne, which is like culture, constitutes the social world. And attending to culture helps us analyze how the logics of capital, of race, and of gender, and of eugenics, and more are proper targets of critique as we seek systematic social change. Because the different subsystems are co-integrated in the broader social formation, intervening in one domain is a way of intervening in the whole, for our actions have a ripple effect and small interventions in one domain can bring about broad change. And again, I'm not gonna be able to make that plausible this time, but I'm gonna be talking about it a lot next time. And at the same time, intervening along one dimension in the healthcare system or in political system or whatever, requires a consideration of all the others for the dynamics that produce them are systemically linked. Okay. All right, so. Systems and structures, this is the most fun part, really. Lots of good pictures. Not fewer words, more pictures. Okay, social practices. So I'm a practice theorist, and there we are, and we need to coordinate, because if we don't coordinate, we die, right? It's just a human imperative. It's absolutely essential. So here's the picture. I think that there's a set of social meanings, and I call it the cultural techne, these are going to be concepts. They're also, we're going to get logics in there about patterns of inference, rules, et cetera, norms, and all of that sort of stuff. And they're public. They're not in your head. Like the language, you learn a language, you put it in your head, but it exists even when it's not in your head, right? So that's going to be the, the cultural techne. When it's bad, and we'll talk more about bad, it's an ideology. And then what happens is that we humans use what's available in the social meanings to interpret the things in the world. Now the things in the world are potential resources to us. So here's a bunny. That can be valued and we can respond to it in different ways. We can respond to it as a pet, as food, as a pelt, as a wild animal. These are different ways that we could respond to the bunny. And in different settings, there's a dominant suggestion that this or that is the way you ought to interact with the, with the bunny. So here we are. If we're in that setting, then we, we use the social meanings as a way to filter our experience, filter what we see and how we respond to the world, and that allows us to form attitudes that then enable us to act on the bunny 
And so we breed them to be fat and slow and, you know, not run away when you come up to them. Because, you know, pets, you don't want them to run away. They're not, you know, you don't want them to be wild animals because they might bite you or run away, whatever. So then, and that reinforces that bunnies are pets. So here is a looping between the cultural techne, the resources that we have available to us in the world, and we act on the world and reinforce the connection. Okay, this also happens with people. Is this individual a friend, a mother, or a sex object? Is this person a friend, a janitor, or a criminal? So these different resources that we have available to us that we become fluent in, like we become fluent in a spoken language, they, they provide a way of engaging with each other and engaging with the world. Okay, so in words, Social practices are patterns of learned behavior that, at least in the primary instances, enable us to coordinate as members of a group in creating, distributing, managing, maintaining, and eliminating a resource. Because the resources, even though it sounds weird, can be bad, like, like getting rid of toxic waste or something like that, or garbage, because we have a way of thinking about things as waste, and so we need to get rid of them. And then there's a cultural techne, a logic for how to do that. And we're going to talk about next time about how you can change that and reconsider what waste is. But that's a whole other part, part of the story. Due to mutual responsiveness to each other's behavior and the resources in question, as interpreted through the cultural techne. Okay, now, just to give you a vivid sense of the cultural techne of an academic lecture or a public lecture like this, I bet not a single one of you deliberated about whether you were going to come in and sit in this chair for the whole lecture, right? It never occurred to you, right? Did it occur to anybody that you might come and sit up here? No. That's because you're fluent, you're socially fluent in the norms about academic lectures. You've been learning them since you were a little kid and you've grown up and so you don't even have to consider that as a possibility because you know this is not where you're going to sit. I mean, Rahel and, and, you know, anyway, we deliberated where we were going to start but you didn't because you're fluent, right? And that's what social practices do for us. They enable us not to have to deliberate about a bunch of stuff because this is how we do it. And that's where the cultural techne comes in. You interpret it, but it has to be public because it can't be just in your head because, oh my gosh, then you couldn't coordinate with anybody. Okay, so that's, where it, that's how it works. Okay, so social relations are established in practices. X is the friend of, the teacher of, the parent of. I am the professor right here and you are my audience. Well, that's a relation that we have, have developed it, just in these last 30 minutes. Okay. Um, and so we develop through our practices, relations, and the structures, social structures, are networks of relations. They consist of places, usually in, in graph theory it's nodes and edges, and the network forms the skeleton of the complex dynamic system. Okay, so at the base there's us interacting, relying on a cultural techne, responding to each other. We form relations, social relations to each other. They're networked, right? We all have networks of people, others, you know, are here, whatever. And they're constantly, you know, dynamic and we develop new networks. You might meet people here, that changes your network, you have a different relationship with them. And that is a protein, actually a picture of a protein, because nobody's managed to take a picture of all of society at once in, the mo in this kind of thing. Okay, so that's a protein, but that is a, a sample of, of the kind of thing society is. Okay, so what is a complex system and what makes a system complex? There are simple systems. I mentioned car engines. That's a simple system. There's chaos. Don't want to go there, right? That's very bad. And then there's complex systems which are organized complexity. Now, it doesn't mean it's just complicated. Car engines can be pretty complicated. It means something slightly different. So, complex systems are self-organizing, self-reproducing and adaptive, and they're non-linear. And one of the reasons is because people tend to think about says, the world as like level upon level, you know, it's the little, the, the muons and whatever, and then they get into like, atoms and molecules and then life forms and then consciousness and there are all these levels. 
doesn't work that way. There's looping, looping, looping from all around all of these different levels. And so what's going to happen is that you can't get things to be quite so linear and predictable when things are interacting with each other and affecting each other at different levels. Okay, there it is again. Uh, the behavior of individuals in a system is not fully predictable, but neither is it random. If it were random, we'd be over in chaos. We're not in chaos. We've got some organized complexity. Um, interactions give rise to stable emergent features of the whole by virtue of the internal structure. And there's all kinds of, I've already given you some uh, body parts and economies and anthills, whatever. The structure of a system affects the individuals in it and the interactions that are possible, but the structure and system evolve, and it's more like a spiral than a loop. So it's self-reinforcing, but it, it changes as it goes, right? And you can have parts of it are going to, uh, certain loops will be more reinforcing of the system maintaining itself, and others will be more supportive of it going in new directions. Uh, in such systems, Again, going back to who's in charge here, local interactions can spontaneously self-organize without external intervention or central authorities. So the state is not in charge. Just, just for the political scientists in the room, just wanted to make sure everyone was clear about that. Okay, so system dynamics. There's a difference between open systems and closed systems. Closed systems, the environment doesn't make much difference and there are hardly any of them, don't worry about them. Open systems are going to have inputs and outputs from the environment. And the trick is going to be in an open system to individuate it by the integration and interdependence of the things in it. In the environment, you know, it affects us, but we don't affect, like the weather affects us, well, we kind of affected the weather. That's a bad example. But anyway, when you're walking down the street, you know, the weather affects you, but putting up your umbrella doesn't change the weather. Okay, just saying. Just in case you didn't know. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so here is um, Hiroaki Katano. This is kind of an old text, um, but I think it's really useful. In systems biology, the focus is on understanding a system structure and dynamics. Because a biological system is not just an assembly of genes and proteins, its properties cannot be fully understood merely by drawing diagrams of their interconnections. Again, going back to the sociologists, right? They do a lot of that. Um, I love sociologists and political scientists. I hope you know. All, I mean, I could never do what I do if I didn't love them, right? Because I'd read all of their stuff all the time. But, you know, we all have our things. You know, philosophers too. Anyway, sorry. Um, uh, properties can be fully understood merely by drawing diagrams of their interconnections. Although such a diagram represents an important force first step, it is analogous to a static roadmap, whereas what we really seek to know are the traffic patterns and why such traffic patterns emerge and how we can control them. Okay, traffic patterns. What I'm going to be arguing is the, the dynamics of the system isn't just capitalism, isn't just the logic of capitalism. There are many dynamics that are affecting how our system reproduces itself and evolves. Okay, co-integration. Here's Susie, and Susie has a dog. So Susie goes into a bar, and she drinks too much, and she comes out of the bar, and she had left her dog chained to the fence or whatever outside, the dog has slipped the, the collar, right, and has gotten away. So Susie is like going, oh my God, what am I going to do? <clears throat> so she starts walking, and she hears the dog, and she walks closer to the dog, and she calls the dog, and the dog, who's off sniffing something, comes closer to her, and they keep responding to each other, right? So this is a picture, oh, oh, that's Jose. Um, here's a picture. So the top line is the picture of Susie and her dog, and the, and the squiggly one that kind of gets pretty questionable. That's another dog who doesn't know Susie and doesn't care about Susie. Susie and her dog are co-integrated because their behavior is responsive to each other. The dog doesn't want to get too far from Susie. Susie doesn't want to get too far from the dog. And so even though they never quite get, find each other, they're, they're systematically related to each other. Now, that is what co-integration is, very roughly. 
And that's what makes a system a system, is that the parts of it are co-integrated. They're being responsive to each other. They're not just going off in unpredictable ways. The environment is not co-integrated with the parts of a system because it affects the system, but the system doesn't affect it back. Okay, and it's going to be relative. What counts as a system or is going to depend on what questions you're asking. So, you know, when I was talking about the weather, yeah, when we talk about all of human society, that is co-integrated with the climate. But, but, you know, in here, we're not really co-integrated with the climate. So the system, that's going to be sort of question relative. Okay, here are two examples. Crimigration. Crim um, Jose Mendoza has a nice paper on this. And he points out, crimigration is a term used by migration scholars to refer to three areas in which criminal law enforcement and immigration law enforcement are problematically conflated. The first is when criminal convictions come to have immigration consequences, such as the revocation of a visa or a green card. The second is when immigration law violations come to have criminal style punishments. And the third is when the tactics sanctioned for criminal law enforcement are commandeered for the purposes of performing immigration enforcement or vice versa. And this is rampant in the US and I don't know if it is in Germany, but it's just like you cannot pull apart immigration and criminal law anymore. Here's another one, one that's very dear to my heart because I have adopted children, um, African American adopted children, and Child Protective Services is a big part of the lives of many black families because they have the power to take children away. Um, this is Dorothy Roberts, and she's documented the co-integration of Child Protective Services and criminal justice. So Child Protective Services go into families with the thought that the child is being abused or neglected and removes the child from the home. Just to make it very vivid, I've been charged with uh, abuse and neglect of my children even though I swear to God I never abused and neglected them because especially when there are black children or black parents involved, they're on you all the time. And this is something that you don't realize if you're a white affluent family in the United States because they don't really pay attention to you. So the symbi symbiotic relationship between law enforcement and child welfare agencies systematically buttresses a police state in black communities by triggering investigations into family life, reinforcing surveillance with our might and threatening families with both prison and child removal. And it's amazing what you will do when someone is saying, we're gonna take your child away from you unless you do X, Y, and Z. You do X, Y, and Z. Poverty, because it's correlated with difficulty in providing for a child's basic needs, itself is considered a basis for removal. So poor black families have children removed just because they don't have enough beds or they don't have enough food. Because, you know, of course, the welfare system is shit in the United States. Um, and, of course, involvement with the criminal justice system affects one's employment options. There's a large, you know, many studies about how children who are removed from families and put in foster care are more likely to end up in prison and they're more likely to you know never really be able to develop the skills to have a decent job and so even when they're when they're relieved from prison anyway you you get the idea uh, i would spend too much time on that slide and i have to keep moving so here's the recap. Our contemporary social order is a complex system with multiple co-integrated subsystems. The relevant subsystems are criminal justice, immigration, child protective services, for example, which co-integrate and form broader systems. Here, I'm insisting on attention to the concrete local formations, how specific practices oppress. It is a capitalist system, but it's also patriarchal, white supremacist, nationalist, eugenicist, etc., because the dynamics or logics of these different forms of oppression interact in ways that cause the system to change and evolve. So again, I'm sympathetic to the idea that there, there are forces of patriarchy and forces of white supremacy, but I don't think they're separate systems. I think that part of the issue is the system is one where these different logics and different dynamics are playing a role and they interact with each other in very complicated ways in the material systems of transportation, healthcare, child protective services and all of that. Okay, what are the logics? How am I doing, I'm all right? Okay, system dynamics and cultural logics. Granted, it may be that patriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism aren't separate systems. They're deeply co-integrated. 
but isn't it still plausible? So here I'm trying to channel uh, Nancy a little bit. Um, that our current social formation is controlled by capitalism. That's the main dynamic. Isn't patriarchy a capitalist formation that functions in a process of social reproduction? And isn't white supremacy a capitalist formation that functions in a proper process of expropriation? Right? That's, that certainly, it's doing that. That's certainly happening. That gender is part of the story about social reproduction and race is part of the story about expropriation. And I'm not going to deny that. But culture does not abide by the logic of capitalism. This is William Sewell, uh, someone whose work has influenced me tremendously. Uh, he's a social historian who, say I don't read that many philosophers, to be honest, except for the critical theorists. I read the critical theorists, but most of the rest of them I don't so much. Anyway, so he's a social historian, worked on the French Revolution mainly, but is known very much for his social theory. He says, this is quotes from him, the network of semiotic relations that make up culture is not isomorphic with the network of economic, political, geographical, social, or demographic relations that make up what we usually call a society. A given symbol, mother, red, polyester, liberty, wage labor, or dirt, is likely to show up not only in many different locations and a particular institutional domain, so motherhood, you know, it play, shows up in millions of families and the different formations in those families, but in a variety of different institutional domains, welfare mothers as a potent political symbol, the mother tongue and linguistic quarrels, the mother of God and the Catholic Church. So mother is not just, you know, staying neatly confined within the framework of the nuclear family. Mother has this incredible, the symbol, mother, the bit of the social meaning mother, it's traveling all over the place. Culture then may be thought of as a network of semiotic relations, and here semiotic relations, I'm thinking like social meanings broadly, cast across society, a network with a different shape and different spatiality than institutional or economic or political networks. The meaning of a symbol in a given context may, may therefore be subject to redefinition by dynamics entirely foreign to that institutional domain or spatial location. Gender and race and nationality and disability and all of these, they are part of the cultural techne. They are their logics associated with culture that can suddenly show up in places that you never imagined. So can polyester or dirt. Anyway, uh, so gender and race as kinds of positions emerge when the management of resources involves categorizing or marking individuals to fulfill different roles in the structure. This is all about what I'm going to talk about in my third lecture, about how the gender marking positions you to do the care work, right? And that is a very deep fact about every known society, to be honest. Um, so, uh, sex and color and other forms of, of vulnerability are become salient ways to mark people for certain roles. And when the logics of these categories dictate what is possible for members of the group, then you've got the beginnings, the basis for, for systematic injustice and systematic deprivation, etc. So there's the balloons, okay, and there you get marked. And then, and these are the disability markers that you get. Okay, so I'm moving, trying to move a little quickly now. So cultural, economic logics, political logics, sexual logics, caregiving logics interact and evolve in response to each other in the system's environment. These are cultural logics um, about symbolic distinctions among concert audiences, just in case you're wondering. So, you know, proteins, concert audiences, when you think about as broadly and abstractly as I do, it's all the same. It's all the same. Um, not only the logic of capitalism, but the logics of race, gender, eugenics, nationality, and those that emerge in particular so social formations are crucial to explaining and disrupting the system that oppresses us. So what we, we need to recognize is that part of what we need to do is change the practices. The practices have this material dimension and the cultural dimension, and so those are already two leverage points where you can intervene and try to bring about change. The fluidity of culture, however, that I've just been talking about is reason to hope. For social meanings are not controlled by the state or the law or the economy, and it is a domain where the oppressed have some power. Think about non-binary people, right? Whoa, 
there's power there. There's power of changing practices, changing pronouns, changing all of this. And the state's not doing it, right? People on the ground by changing their practices are doing it. Okay, so here's a conclusion. That's, those are the threads that I need to wrap up, just in case you're wondering. All the pictures have, have deep meaning, because I'm really into meaning. Anyway, those are the threads. I know it's really a tangle, but I'm gonna try and wrap it up. Okay, social systems have dynamics that both outstrip and recruit our agency. So we need to get a feel for the big picture and watch for ways that our efforts at social change will be frustrated or even co-opted by the system. So yeah, we know, we try to make a change and boom, the next thing we know we're deeper in the shit. Sorry, I hope that's okay. Um, okay, but at the same time, the problems we face as individuals and the sites where we're likely to have impact are local and within the institutions we navigate on a regular basis. Through participation in social practices, we gain knowledge of how they work and what sustains them and makes them valuable and what alternative options are feasible. So that, that engagement in these practices and reflection on them in the day-to-day -day of your life about what are you presupposing, what is the logic you're relying on, this is an incredibly rich resource for agents to begin critique, right? You're not going to be able to critique you know, in, in, a, in a way that will make a difference if all you're thinking about is capitalism is grinding us down. Yes, it is, no question about it, but how is it doing it right here, in this moment, and this moment, and this moment? And how is gender doing its thing in this moment, and this activity, and this form of life? How are you being affected by gender this very second, or for race, or, you know, nationality or immigration status or whatever. It's happening right here in your lives. And so it's great to think about the big picture. I'm not against it. But you've got to think about it in your body. Okay, I'm getting carried away. I'm sorry, I get carried away. Okay, <clears throat> both of these sources of knowledge, broad th th theory and embedded agency, are important for effective social intervention, but only if they inform each other. So, I don't know if you've seen this, think globally, act locally. Well, I have a new bumper sticker. It's act locally, think globally, adjust local action, then revise global strategy, and then repeat. You know, this is, Rahel was saying, you know, my, my activist friends laugh at me because, you know, I'm not satisfied with think globally and act locally because I want it to be more complex, right? Because it should be more complex, but, you know, that's why I'm up here doing philosophy and critical theory and interdisciplinary whatever because I, th I can't get a basic bumper sticker. Okay, okay, context of change matters. There isn't a recipe for social change. Changing the relationship between workers and capitalists is not the same as changing the relationship between husbands and wives or immigrant caretakers and their sponsors. You can't say, okay, now we've got it all figured out. Form a union. You go, huh, I'm sorry, that's not gonna work. Uh, so the first impulse to change arises in resistance to the practices that shape the lives of those we care about. This is also where things of value are distributed, right? That's, that matters, and that's where push comes to shove, right? Because you're not getting what you need, or you're not getting what's valuable, and your relationships to your loved ones are being you know, disrupted. So there's a local motivational imperative, but once we see how the practices that damage us are more broadly damaging and how difficult it is to change them, we need this global perspective. That's an epistemic imperative. You need to step back and think about the system. But the fact remains that our agency occurs and is constrained locally, and this is where we have to find ways to resist. So there's both epistemic and motivational imperatives. So I'm gonna be talking a lot about what these imperatives are and how to act on them as we go forward. So when we focus on projects that seek social change at the broadest scale, I think they're either going to fail to be actionable or they're going to lose touch with the knowledge that's gained locally and its radical potential. So, Fraser cautions, uh, that romantic view 
one that isn't entirely focused on the capitalist dynamics of the social order, is held today by a fair number of anti-capitalist thinkers and left-wing activists, including cultural feminists, deep ecologists, and neo-anarchists, as well as by many proponents of plural, post-growth, solidary, and popular economies. Too often, these currents treat care, nature, direct action, or commoning as intrinsically anti-capitalist. And as a result, they overlook the fact that their favorite practices are not only sources of critique, but are integral parts of the capitalist order. So this is what I'm arguing against. I'm arguing against suggesting that if you're not thinking of it in capitalist terms, you're not thinking of it radically. I'm sorry. You know, I've, I'm almost 70 years old. I've been doing this for a really long time. You can read this. You're welcome. If our social system is complex with multiple dynamics, this approach is misguided. We need to be working on a wide range of practices and the dynamics that sustain them. And we need to do this on the ground, responsive to local conditions and with care, right? Care, it's not all about capitalism. Within dynamic systems, network local efforts are the key. And I'll be talking about that in the third lecture. Here is um, Dean Spade. Transformative mo social movements depend both on structured organizing and mass protest. This is something that Robin Chang has argued. Wherever you are, Robin, thank you. Um, uh, social structured organizing focuses on micro interventions that are responsive to the needs of individuals and their values and builds upon those relationships that change social relations and networks. This is not romanticism, which is sometimes what the previous quote suggested. Dean Spade has captured the insight, and Dean is mainly concerned with um, queer and trans mutual aid and building from queer and trans mutual aid systems into broader social movements. And he says, mutual aid projects let us practice meeting our own and each other's needs based in shared commitments to dignity, care, and justice. They let us practice coordinating our actions together with the belief that all of us matter and we should all get to participate in the solutions to our problems. They let us realize that we know best how to address the crises we face. We don't need to be saved by professional government agents or people elites consider experts. We need to cultivate the practices and structures that move us toward our goal, a society organized by collective self-determination where people get a say in all parts of their lives rather than just facing the coercive non-choice between sinking or swimming, between joining a brutal and exploitive workforce, insurance scheme or housing market, or being left out in the cold. Okay, conclusion. Societies are complex dynamic systems that coordinate us through material practices. In our current social formation, the dynamics of the system include patriarchal capitalist, white supremacist, and eugenic logics. We change systems by changing practices on the ground. Each of us has something to contribute to this process, for practices continue because we enact them. When you go home tonight, think about who's doing the laundry, thinking about who's taking care of the child, thinking about, think about, who is doing the cooking, right? I'm not saying that you're doing it wrong. All I'm saying is look at yourselves and look at the people around you and look at the networks that you're part of, right? Because we're all reenacting this. I am too, you know. I mean, I do a lot of caregiving. Okay, just saying. To be effective, we also need to be attentive to the big picture, how systems maintain themselves. So we need to attend to both the micro and the macro levels. Remember I talked about that at the beginning, but the meso level, the level of practices and collective action, this is the space where contextual knowledge and solidarity can enable transformative change. And I'm gonna talk about that in the next lecture. Thank you very much. So, Sally, thank you so much for such a rich <clears throat> and such a dynamic lecture, actually, on the dynamics of social change. That was wonderful, and we're all looking forward to what you have to say 
tomorrow. But for now we have a Q&A and as we have already indicated, there are two mics. At the one is at the left, one is at the right aisle. So please queue behind those mics if you want to ask a question. And for all of those who don't feel comfortable asking a question in English, just ask in German. We are will do our best to translate. I think we have roughly 20 minutes or so. Okay, so you go first. Uh, howdy, Sally, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank Long you. Long time listener, first time caller. I really enjoyed the talk and the lecture. I'm excited for the other ones. This is just a really tiny clarificatory question. You talk about practices, and there's a kind of natural way to think about practices is like what I do when I go home and like how to you know, how do we exist in an auditorium like this, these kind of schemata, right? But the way you talk about it, it's much more, I think, a richer picture where it loops into this notion of cultural technique. And so I kind of want you to expand a little bit on this. And I think the one thing that I'm concerned about, and you might talk about this later, is how access to epistemic resources and access to different kinds of cultural technique, if you will, um, might affect the kind of practices people are willing to implement. So here I'm thinking, of course, of Miranda Fricker's work on epistemic injustice, but also just thinking like a lot of the practices are kind of abnegation kind of practices, uh, a kind of freedom from having to do stuff, right? So, and I'll just end with this brief example. In Berlin, uh, I once took one of my friends to a club and I said, well, you have to kind of wear these things, you have to do these things, you have to act this way. And he was like, and he's like the straight cis white guy. And he's like, why do I have to do, why can't I just be myself? Why do I have to like dress a certain way and get a haircut and da 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 da? And I'm like, that's what it's like for most of us all the time, right? And so it's this kind of uh, epistemic resource that I think might be missing in the picture. Great, should I go? Yeah, <clears throat> so I completely agree with you that, um, that what happens, so I'm interested in the epistemology of ignorance and I think this is an important part of it. So white people can go around the world um, in the United States thinking they know how things work and how everything is, but there's whole domains of life that they're totally ignorant about. I was just telling you what the example of child protective services. None of my white friends have ever had to deal with child protective services, right? There's just total ignorance there. So, so one of the things that that happens when you're caught in a set of practices is that you get kind of blinders on and you only notice the things that are relevant to coordinating with your people, right? So, so you know how to coordinate in an academic environment because we're your people and you know what you have to do and what you don't have to do. And you go into another environment, be it cross-cultural or sub-communities sub or whatever, and suddenly you're doing things that are not, re are not legible to people. And so part of what I think happens with the cultural techne is that you're, there's kind of, <laughs> sometimes with the, there's sparkle dust on the things that you need to pay attention to around here. Like where is the podium? Where is the, the screen? You know, where are the seats facing? And things like that. There's sparkly dust on all of that so that when you walk in a room, those are the things you notice. There are a million things you don't notice, right? But you go into a new environment and suddenly you'll notice the things that you normally, but that's not how people are organizing themselves. And so you have to kind of really move to a different way of being perceptive in the world and experiencing the world and being responsive to the world. So I think it is, I mean, I'm not as, um, in, so hermeneutic injustice, the Fricker notion of hermeneutic injustice is closer than testimonial injustice to what I'm talking about here. But a lot of my other work is on, um, conceptual engineering and working to change the resources that we have for understanding the world because I think that that can shift how we interact with each other and interact with the world. Is that making sense? Okay. Uh, hi, uh, 
Uh, can I have the second yeah, question? Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your wonderful lecture. And uh, I'm curious about this looping effect uh, that you mentioned. Uh, so we have the cultural schema, and we have the resources. And these two parts uh, reinforce towards each other and make it stronger and stronger. And it is true that uh, every social members are living in this kind of very strong looping effect. And it is get, getting stronger and stronger. Uh, over time. So my question is, how is it possible to get out of this looping? Uh, if we consider like the natural uh, systems, like climate, we all know that it is very powerful, uh, the, the climate is. And we, we, we should take enormous effort so that we can uh, make a little difference for that system. And as social members, we are all a part of this reinforcement system. And uh, so even, even if we want to reflect on the situation, all the resources that we can use to, ref, uh, to reflect are all from this kind of this, uh, situation and the looping effect. So where can we get those resources external to this system so that we can uh, make a change of system? or? The, the only way that we can have the resources is from the system itself. And that's my question, thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, one of the things about concepts and rules and norms is that they don't apply themselves. We have to apply them, right? And we can do so in ways that are slightly off kilter and get away with it sometimes. And um, so Judith Butler talks this about the citationality of norms and how sometimes, and, and sort of gendered rules and whatever, and you can cite something but, but distort it or, or change it in, in ways. And I do think that that gives us uh, opportunities for incremental change that can build up over time. So that's one way that things can change. I think also um, the fact that we're not stuck in just one single subsystem. We're in many subsystems. We play a role in the economy and the home and you know, we are political agents and all of these sorts of things. And there are different norms and there are different meanings that are not always consistent with each other. And so we can use some to, to sort of critique the other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there are a variety of different ways that, that um, so individually, we don't make much difference. So me recycling doesn't make much difference. And so the biggest things that we can do have to do with coordinating and building movements and building networks so that when we slightly adjust, we can kind of all do it together. Like you take one step to the side of the boat, just one person, and the boat doesn't tip over. But if you get everybody on the boat to run in the direction of that side, you could tip the boat over, right? So, so it's that kind of, that's where social movements are going to come in. Because, you know, each of us doing a little bit in a way that's networked and organized can make a difference, I think. There's another whole dimension of your question that, I, that I'll talk more about is, I think that we do need technology to have really dramatic, so climate change, we're gonna to have to rely on technology. I think technology, I am at MIT, but it's not just because I'm at <laughs> MIT. Um, I do think that we have to engage together in thinking creatively outside the box and not just kind of invent technology that's going to reinforce, even though it may change the climate, it's gonna reinforce you know, terrible economic disparities or cultural obliterations and such like that. So what another thing I think is really important is being involved in how technology is developed and what sort of technology is developed. Um, and I'm not talking about chat GPT. I mean, that's not the, <laughs> the last of my worries right at the moment. You know, I'm worried about, you know, bio, using biomass for fuel to, as cook stoves so that you don't chop down the trees and create deforestation. I mean, I mean, there's lots and lots and lots of things that can be done drawing on local knowledge that, that we need to inform the people at MIT who are you know, brilliant in many ways, but stupid in many ways, right? About how to, how to really change the kinds of technologies that people on the ground are gonna be using. Thank okay. you. Next question. Um, 
thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I mean, super interesting. I have a million questions, and I will only ask one. Uh, and it has to do, I guess, with what, um, with what you're trying to explain. I'm not fully understand, f fully sure I understand the, like, the, what, what you and the views you're critical of are trying to explain. Because it seemed like when you, so for example, when you cite the Sewell Jr. Um, uh, quote, it's like you're trying to explain social meanings. And the point is that culture is, is not isomorphic to something like the economic base, um, which seems pretty plausible as a story about what explains cultural meanings. But if we're trying to explain something different, which is social change, it seems like we might have, uh, we might have to, um, it just seems like the, like the, the explanation, like the argument is going to be a little bit different. Um, and so then it becomes maybe a little bit more plausible as to why Frazier, for example, would say that like capitalism is pushing things along. Because, you know, for example, you give the, the example of a, of, of a hospital having its own kind of internal dynamic. But someone might just then point out that like the, the given resources that a hospital has um, is going to be determined by market conditions or something like that. And so I guess I'm just trying to, like, the, the first question is, like, what, what is it that's being explained? Is it cultural meanings or is it social change? And then the, the second question is, does that, does, does this, you know, change the, the nature of the debate between you and Frazier or, like, you and the sort of naive base superstructure theorist? Yeah, so I don't think that hospitals just run on a capitalist logic. I think they run on all multiple logics that are involved in them, like who's doing the dirty work? It's going to be mostly black and brown people. Who is doing the care work? It's mostly women. And I think that there are norms that women bring to care work that aren't capitalist logic, right? I think there's caregiving logic that's involved, and that's why they're so easily exploited. So yes, Hospitals do run partly on capitalist logics, but they run also on white supremacist logics and gender logics and a variety of other logics. And these logics will interact with each other in complicated ways. So you have people in hospitals who are refusing to do what they're supposed to do because they're not going to sacrifice the well-being of their patients for some capitalist logic. And that's important, right? And so I think that, yes, I'm trying to explain how hospitals work. And I think it's very reductionist to think that hospitals work according to a capitalist profit logic. That's how you're going to look at it when you're looking at it economically. But if you're looking at a hospital from a gendered perspective, profit is not the main thing you're going to be looking at. What you're going to be looking at is who are the people who are changing the bedpans? Who are the people who are holding the hands of the dying person? That's a logic that's different from a capitalist logic. Also, I'm really concerned here because the whole point was that these practices are creating those relations which are what actually structure the system. And these practices are governed by culture, right? How you interact with someone at a table depends on what gender they are and what race they are and what class they are. And so those meanings affect the kinds of relationships that are possible that are making this happen. And so, yeah, a capitalist logic is part of it. If the person is of a different class or if you've got to get to work and so you have to leave early, you know, there's going to be capitalist logics which are responsible for the kinds of relation, the kinds of friendships you have, where you go to meet people, what you eat, etc. All of that is going to have a capitalist dimension to it, but it's not just a capitalist dimension that makes a difference when we're forming social relations. Parenting relations are not driven mainly by capitalist logics, but parenting relations are going to be hugely important in how you raise a child to become a laborer or not, and what kind of labor you're expecting them to do. So I'm just saying, I think, I think that this picture makes it very clear that culture plays a role and the, and the marking of bodies as what you're for and what you do and how you care for people and how you don't care for people and what values you have, that is playing a huge role in sustaining this. Just saying, sorry. I get in, intense because I think it's so important. And hospitals, yeah, families. It's not all about the logic, of capitalist logic. Thank you. So next one. Um, Hi, um, I'd like a, to ask a question about the differentiation between the micro, meso, and macro level, because I'm not sure that I understand it. 
Um, and I'd like to give you an example. For example, me and my male friends, roommates, boyfriends, etc., are sitting at a table and they will never make the move to get up and clear the table first. This absolutely 100% of the time. And my question is, okay, the micro level is our interaction at the table. The macro level is gender socializ socialization and patriarchal culture for last couple of millennia. Um, where exactly is the meso level? And for example, would me telling them that they are engaging in a sexist behavior make me an activist in that moment? Am I just acting? in my personal um, capacity, um, and how do these different spheres interact? Thank you, thank you for that. So I do think that that's a kind of micro-level interaction. Um, what I'm interested in is how that micro-level interaction is both conditioned by the practices that your male friends have learned, right? They've learned to notice things and not notice things, right? They've learned to, to take to have a kind of sense of obligation to do thing or not. Those are the logics, so that sense of obligation, oh, I noticed this, that means I ought to do that. That's part of the cultural logic that is, is um, available to lots of males and lots of females. They have different logics about how they interact and how they interact with the food on the table and how they interact with each other. And that goes beyond you and your friends, as you pointed out, it's, it's like, all over the place. And so there's you and your friends, but then there's this pattern that you get that is governed by a process where we learn how to see things, notice things, react to things, and we do it collectively. It's not just one off. And you do it one way because all of your female friends and your parent, you know, your mother or your whatever have done it that way. And so I'm not trying to generalize about everybody. Of course, we all are different, blah, blah, blah. But there are patterns here. So that's the meso level, right? The meso level is the particular practice. Now, in the particular practice in Germany or the United States or something, that hasn't been going on for millennia, right? But there's a generalization of it that has been going on for millennia, namely women take care of everybody, and men take advantage of us. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. So I think we have time for two more questions, and, or maybe more. Uh, hi, thank you for your very engaging talk. I really enjoyed it. And um, I hope I am able, will be able to phrase my question comprehensively. So. Um, you mentioned that uh, basically the different logics will interact in ways with our agency that is kind of, that will frustrate it or co-opt it and that we need to look out for the ways in which this is happening. And what I am wondering about is a very practical problem of that uh, I think it requires a lot of awareness to be able to see these ways and um, to also be, I mean, to know that this is something that is happening. And I'm not sure if you know byung Chul Han for an example, but he says that power relations nowadays, or often, especially in, in these times, um, are characterized by us saying an emphatic yes to what they want from, like what someone wants from us to be, by that we, we feel like we enjoy what we're asked Sub, like subtly are asked to do. So the power relations are actually very um, invisible. And so I'm wondering about how to cultivate a culture of awareness for myself, but also um, for, for others, I guess. Like, you're, for example, attending this le lecture, I guess, and holding this lecture, both are steps in a great direction. But um, I, don't have, I don't have that many friends, for example, who are here today. <laughs> so, yes. So let, let me see if I understood the question. So the question is, look, it's really hard to, main, maintain, to be reflective about everything you do every day, right? We can't do that. I told you, like I'm an incredible caregiver. I do a huge amount of caregiving. Anyway, and you can't be, and being reflective about it every day and every moment is impossible. And also it's not clear what to do because you can't just start refusing to care for people, among other things. I mean, because they need you and they depend on you, and you love them, and, and you want to do things for them. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about this in the third lecture, and yeah, and it's meaningful to you, and, and because you love them. And so what are you supposed to do, like not love them? You can't do it, and that would be bad, 
right? So, so I can see, is this the kind of problem you're worried about? Uh, that is the one part, and then the other one is how to actually even become this kind of person, human, that is aware of these processes, Yeah, practically speaking. Yeah, so how to become aware and then how to maintain it and live with it. Whoa. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, get some new friends <laughs> who, are, <laughs> who are like really worried about this all the time. Uh, and you know, can hold your hand as you're sobbing, you know, anyway. Um, I, I think becoming aware of it, I think reading, talking to people, uh, finding in your heart places where it hurts and you haven't let yourself find that place. Read Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde is amazing. Um, uh, that would be a good start. Read Audre Lorde. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and then, and then, and then, uh, giving yourself a break sometimes. Adrienne Marie Brown talks about this a lot. How you can't just struggle all the time. You've got to give yourself breaks, and you've got to give yourself breaks with the, your friends. Um, I feel like I'm trying to be a sort of. I don't know. I'm just a philosopher. I can't tell you how to live a life. I mean, I'm trying, but <laughs> how to live a life that's impossible and that, yeah. Uh, so how do you cultivate that? Yeah, reading a lot and talking a lot and reflecting a lot and then crying and beating your head against a wall and then finding some other people who will hold you after you've beaten your head against the wall. Right. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have any advice for the poor woman? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> oh, activism. Black Lives Matter. That one of the things that their big message is, is that the more you engage in activism, the more it's healing it is. It's healing to yell and scream at, and, and then do something different. Anyway. So we have three more questions, and I think we are going to group them, and you just... Yeah, yeah, fine. That sounds great. That sounds great. So, Sally, hi. Hi. Um, I had a sa the same worry that someone speaking five minutes ago also had, also connecting to the Sewell quote. Yeah. It was either the quote or the paraphrase. I can't remember. It was a quote. And I remember you endorsing it. And Love saying it is extremely important that we see that the different cultural social spheres are not the same, not identical, and maybe not even isomorphic. This is yep. what some people might think. Yep. And we should see that it's not so. Yeah. And I think it's true, but I think that the opponent or the enemy here is a scapegoat, namely yeah. or a straw man, namely the straw man of a reductionist or like a vulgar reading of Bourdieu where everything reflects the class structure in different forms of expressions. And I would have said it's important to see that culture is not economy, is not family life, is not education, is not religion, etc. But that social theory would be the discourse reconnecting the things that seem different. But of course, in a, let's say, contemporary, that means non-reductivist way. And I would think what you said afterwards about the networks and the structures are proposals to read different strata, different spheres together, but not reducing them to each other. So, it's, so the first step only is they are not the same and they're not isomorphic and they cannot be reduced to one root. But that capitalism and patriarchy are interconnected and interact in ways that also affects their respective logics, to me seems a pretty important part of social theory. And why am I saying this is in the German context, we had, in a way, a discussion about this, and Luhmann, so German system theory, exactly made that point. So the different systems are independent and autonomous, autopoietic, and that for him was an argument against all forms of social theories connecting them in a causal or explanatory way. And this at the time, this was a discussion from the late 70s, was in a way dividing normative, critical theories from other social theories. And I think in this division, you would be on the other side than Luhmann. And the Sewell quote, in a way, suggests almost the opposite. 
Okay, since we are running out of time, I'm going to group uh, the next question. My question perhaps uh, builds on the previous question. My question was, where is the place of, or what is the function of critical social theory in your uh, picture? Uh, so from what we heard, what I heard tonight, it seemed primarily explanatory. And maybe adding on what's just been said, you could see, maybe, maybe you would want to say it's also diagnostic. I w certainly would want to say, and at least would want to ask you, uh, does social, critical social theory have something to say about the direction of social change? Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful uh, talk. And I, I was wondering if you think that um, the nature of the mental states that instantiate uh, social meanings and co uh, cultural techne is relevant for also figuring out how to do social change. So if, if we are talking about beliefs or some kind of cognitive affective attitudes, and there might be theories in psychology and so on that would talk about this, do you think that it's important to look at, at this type of mental states? Or do you think that well, in the end, it doesn't matter what they are. It matters what they do and how we can, we can change them. Uh, yeah, thanks. Larry? No. <clears throat> Martin, I'm a little bit confused about your question because it seems to me that, first of all, I'm partly responding to Nancy, Nancy Fraser, and I think that I used a number of her quotes which suggested that she and I disagree. We had a recent... Um, very helpful and wonderful interchange where we were trying to figure out whether we agree or disagree and how we agree or disagree. <laughs> so I think that there is a dynamic in certain uh, domains of inquiry around the relationship between capitalism and these other systems that is alive and well, even though you might think it's died. It's, it's not dead yet. I'm trying to kill it. No, just kidding. Um, the second part of it was, I don't see why you need to say that the systems are autonomous in order to avoid reductionism, because reductionism is a level theory. It says that everything goes down to some basic level and there's a single dynamic there. The whole point of systems theory, in my view, is it's not levels and it doesn't go down to a single dynamic. Um, but it's not the case that we want to say that there are autonomous systems, they're co-integrated systems. So I think that the co-integrated systems with dynamics that are competing with each other and struggling with each other are, is a really important part of the story. And I think that, the, that there are two, these two dimensions of where the dynamics come from. One dynamic is cultural, and so there's different cultures. There's, there's economic culture and political culture and all of these different cultures that have different resources. There's also the cultures of gender and of race and of nationality and such. And these are many different dynamics that are interacting with each other and competing in these different domains, like the domain of politics or the economy or such like that. Um, uh, so I think that, but there's also the material Resistance. So I, I'm very big on the fact that you can't make it happen the way you want to have it happen because the world will push back on you. The materiality of the world will push back on you. Human illness and death and aging and bodies and things like that. So there are these two sources of, of dynamics, so to speak. And I'm trying to bring them together and see them as... as really interacting in complex ways, but not in such a way that's either reductionist or chaotic. That's, that's the picture I'm trying to offer. But okay, we'll talk more. Uh, the question about what is critical social theory. So critical social theory, I mean, uh, Robin was mentioning, I think begins in a movement and says, what do we need in order to make this movement work? And uh, sometimes we need explanation. Sometimes we need normative principles. Sometimes we need something. We need lots of different things in movements. Um, and so I, I think that, that at this point, as I mentioned, I was looking more at the ontology 
and less at some of the normative questions, but I personally don't think that critical theory is all about normative stuff, and I don't think it's about giving reasons. I think it's all, entirely, I think it's about trying to understand the nature of the system that we're part of so that we can be effective in trying to intervene in it and bring about change. The kind of change we haven't talked about yet, um, but I don't think it stops being critical theory just because we haven't listed a set of, you know, a, a kind of a normative frame for doing it. I, unlike some critical theorists, think that um, uh, normative commitments are perfectly fine and that, that there are normative truths, there are moral truths, and disagreement about, about values doesn't scare me, it doesn't make me think I'm wrong, because I think that there are some people who are unable to recognize the value of certain things. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be right out there, right? And I know it's not the kind of place where I should be right out there like this, but I am. I am. I'm a moral realist in some important ways. Um, so we can talk more about that. Um, and the final is mental states. Yeah, I think it would be good to have some people working on mental states, but to be honest, that's way too much of that already been done, right? <laughs> it's like people spend all their life, like, oh, it's the, the implicit bias or whatever. I mean, I just think, I just think that's what people feel comfortable with. It's very atomistic. It's very preoccupied with, with models that don't do anything for understanding the social domain, as far as I can tell. Um, people end up saying, oh, well, what we ought to do is just do traditional epistemology and criticize each other's beliefs. And I'm like, no, please, <laughs> please don't go there. Um, but maybe what you were saying is, look, there's... There's things besides belief that we ought to be attentive to. Yes, I agree with that. Um, uh, but I'm going to have other people do that because I hate it. Just saying. <laughs> so, you know, we have to divide labor. Someone else can do the psychology. I'm not going to do that. So any of you want to sign up to do the psychology? That's great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, you're, you're all welcome to attend tomorrow's lecture. Thank you so much, Sally, for tonight, for this wonderful evening, for this, I mean, intriguing and extremely rich and interesting. Thank you so Thank much. You Thank you, everybody. Yeah, it see was you again just, tomorrow. just fabulous. Really great. Thank you. <laughs>